Hi, uh, my name is Benjamin Lee, and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 p.m., so we'll begin our presentation shortly. Today, on September 28th, we'll have our presentation on Housing and Transportation for the Boomers and Beyond. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer those during the presentation and also at the end of the presentation. Here is a list of the sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible. These are the list of upcoming webcasts. To register for these web upcoming webcasts, please visit www.utahapa.org webcasts and register for your webcast of choice. We're now offering distance education webcast to help you get your ethics or law credits before the end of the year. These webcasts are available to view at utahapa.org webcast archive. To log your distance education CM credits, go to planning.org slash CM, select activities by provider, select APA Ohio chapter, then select distance education and select your webcast of choice. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and we also upload the previous presentations on YouTube. So follow us on Planning Webcast. To log your same credits for attending today's webcast, please go to planning.org slash cm, select today's date, September 28th, and then select today's webcast, Housing and Transportation for the Boomers and Beyond. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. We are recording today's webcast and it will be, it'll be available along with a six slide per page PDF of the presentation at utahapa.org webcast archive and also on YouTube. At this time, I would like to introduce our speakers, Rodney and Jana. Rodney Harrell, PhD, is a Senior Strategic Policy Advisor for Housing and Livable Communities in AARP's Public Policy Institute. In his position, he is responsible for developing AARP's policy on housing and livable communities issues, and he's also managing the house, housing research agenda and conducts independent research. Jana Lynott, AICP, is the Senior Strategic Policy Advisor for Transportation and Livable Communities in AARP's Public Policy Institute. She manages AARP's transportation research agenda and is responsible for developing the content of the Livable Communities chapter of the AARP's policy book adopted by the AARP Policy Council and Board. Her research covers a broad array of planning and policy issues including street design for all users, the travel patterns of older adults, transit service needs, and older driver safety and I'll hand it over to Jenna. Jenna? Okay, sorry about that everyone. I struggled to find the button to unmute myself. Um, but as I had wanted to say and was talking into the mic when you, you could not hear me, uh, thank you very much Ben for that introduction and also I want to thank the Virginia chapter for hosting us this afternoon or this morning for those folks who are joining us from the West. Uh, our presentation is on 
transportation and housing for boomers and beyond. So we're talking about really the aging of America and what the implications are for the planning community. In terms of our presentation today, I'm going to start off and be kind of your data person and provide a lot of information on trends that we're seeing in the United States, hit a little bit upon what the implications are, um, especially in the area of transportation, and then turn the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Rodney Harrell, who's going to talk about the, the, some of the housing trends as well as housing policy implications and implications for planning. So to begin, just looking at this chart here, we all know that our nation is aging, and this just puts some of that into perspective. I've pulled uh, some numbers for the 50 and older population. Even though we often think of an older population as 65 and older, we also need to be thinking of those who are moving toward retirement and understand that age wave because the great majority of older adults do age in place in the homes and communities where they're living uh, pre-retirement. So today there are about 100 million persons 50 and older living in the United States. That's about 32% of the total population. And in the next 20 years, we're expecting to that share to grow to about 36% of the population. If you were to pull these same numbers for the 65 and older population, today we have um, about 13% of our total population is age 65 and older, expected to grow by 2025, 2030 to around 20% of the total population. Now one subset of this population is what we know as boomers, those born between 1946 and 1964. 2011 marked the year the first of the baby boom generation reached what used to be known as retirement age of 65. And for the next 18 years, boomers will be turning 65 at a rate of about 8,000 to 10,000 a day. This next uh, line graph really shows the projections for different older groups, and it reflects both the sizable boomer population aging through the lifespan, as well as the fact that our nation's life expectancy is increasing. Thus, for the next 20 years, the population age 65 to 84 and the population 85 and older are expected to grow at very similar rates. However, as baby boomers begin to turn 85, the age 85 plus population will, will grow dramatically. It's really this age group that's most likely to need long-term services and supports, including transportation, accessible housing, etc. But as we well know, aging, the effects of aging really hit individuals at very different points in their life. So it may be 85 for one individual, it may be 65 for another. And we really, as a community of planners, needs to be thinking ahead as to what the implications are and be prepared for an aging population. Another major trend is that most of the growth of the 50 plus is going to come from an increasing diversity in our nation's population. You can see the bottom bar the white population holds fairly steady between now and 2050, and the real growth in this population is coming from a population of Hispanic, Latinos, Blacks, as well as Asians. Another trend that we're watching is that the number of multi-generational households in the United States is growing. And while it's still a minority share of households in the United States, we are more recently seeing an uptick in this population, which reflects both the recent recession with older adults moving home with their parents right out of college, but we're also seeing it as an effect of an aging population, older parents moving in with their younger adult children for assistance. We also have what's called sandwich generations, where you may have boomers who are still caring for a child in their household and assisting mom or dad um, with some of the life needs. And finally, that trend reflects an increasing diversity in the population as well. And you can see that non-white households are much more likely to be multi-generational, whereas about 3% of white households are multi are, have someone 50 and older living with the grandchildren, 15% of Hispanic households have someone 
50 and older living with a grandchild. We also need to think of the aging change in the context of the recent recession and downturn of the economy and the fact that for non-white households, black, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, African American, these households on a national scale lost more than 50% of their net worth between 2005 and 2009. So the, the need for affordable housing and other for affordable services has grown in this country. Another trend is that older adults are postponing retirement. Retirement age is not necessarily 65 any longer. And while the recession has augmented this trend, it certainly could be seen uh, uh, on the red bar among men and women, 65 and older, who are increasing numbers in the labor force. Now, part of the overall effect of what's happening is that, by and large, older adults are choosing to remain in their local communities, in their homes as they age. And the great majority wish to do that. And when you look at census migration data, it's true less than 15% of folks actually move from their community to the Sunbelt, another retirement location. And even among those, as they reach an older age of 85, we see sort of the reverse trend of people returning to be close to their families and support networks. Also, the, the majority of older adults live in either suburban or rural areas. And as planners, we realize that that presents additional challenges to providing services to a population. One in five adults, 65 and older, do not drive. And if you're lucky enough to live until you're age 70, the, on average, there will be seven to 10 years at the end of your lifespan when you no longer drive. Another trend is that even though disability rates in this country are on the decline, the number of older adults who are living with disabilities in the community is rising. And that's not only because there are more older adults in communities, and those older adults are more likely to have a disability than younger persons, but also the effect of decreased inst rates of institutionalization. Fewer and fewer people are choosing nursing homes. Most people are choosing to stay in their homes and try to reach services that they need. And certainly as people age, they're more likely to have a disability that makes it hard to travel. So folks 80 and older, 30%, more than 30% of men, more than 40% of women have a medical condition that does make it difficult to travel outside the home. And having a disability affects older adults in not only their ability to drive, but also their ability to access public transportation and just get around their communities on foot. Fall-related deaths and hospitalizations are more than double those for motor vehicle injuries for those 65 and older, and they cost the United States over $80 million annually. That's $9,000 per fall in direct medical and long-term care costs. Also, streets can pose additional risk to older adults. And this is a chart that shows pedestrians' average risk of death by vehicle speed in the United States for pedestrians of all ages mixed together. And you can see if you're hit as a pedestrian by a motor vehicle at 32 miles per hour, you have a 25% risk of death. Increasing the vehicle speed to just 42 miles an hour increases, it really doubles your risk of death. And that is even more so the case for older adults because of their increased fragility and frailty. The average risk of severe injury or death of a 70-year-old pedestrian struck by a car at 25 miles per hour is similar to the risk for a 30-year-old pedestrian struck at 35 miles per hour. I want to talk just a moment about some additional travel trends of boomers that we've been pulling through out of the National Household Travel Survey. Within the next couple of weeks, I hope, I will have another paper out on the travel trends of boomers, really the impact of this generation on traveling in the United States, looking at travel from 1969 through 2009. And what we found is that boomers are really the demographic engine that has fueled the growth in the nation's travel over the past 40 years. 
And this can be demonstrated best probably through this chart. This shows trends in per capita miles of travel, whether you're choosing to travel by car, bus, bike, walk, etc., all forms of travel. Uh, comparing at each of these different time points, baby boomers' level of travel with all others. And throughout their lifespan, baby boomers on a per capita basis have ha traveled more miles than other people outside of their age demographic. Another trend that we've found in this analysis is that when baby boomers hit their childbearing years and also with women boomers entering the workforce in record numbers, that it was that age um, 20s through, you know, late 40s when vehicular travel really skyrocketed. And since that point, since 1995, travel by boomers in private vehicles has been on the decline. But across their lifespan, we've really seen a trend in per capita trip on public transportation increasing among this generation. Another way to look at this is to look at the share of trips, or in planner speak, the mode share um, of these different generations. And between 2001 and 2009, for all age groups, we've seen a decline in travel by personal vehicle and an increase in travel as a share of total trips that people make. In, on public transportation. And this is really significant because in past travel surveys, researchers documented a decline in use of public transportation among those 65 and older. But we're not finding that true anymore. In fact, the boomers uh, increased as a share of trips on public transportation um, compared to the same age group in 2001, their use by 46%, those 65 and older, 38%. Another uh, trend to keep aware of just in terms of travel patterns is that just as I mentioned that older adults are postponing retirement, they do have somewhat different travel patterns for the commute trip. And for one, they telecommute more, as you can see from this chart, those 65 to 74, 23% report always working from home. Uh, and another trend is that they tend to commute, there's a higher proportion of people at least commuting in the shadows of the peak period. So they tend to leave a little later in the morning and leave a little earlier in the afternoon with a, somewhat of a compressed schedule. And then finally, uh, a trend that we've looked at is travel for leisure groups over 50. Folks are taking more trips, but taking those trips closer to the home. It's become more of the weekend getaway of travel. The exception to this is those 70 and older who are taking more trips and traveling further for those trips. And so there's a couple of things going on in terms of implications. One, you may see more um, risk of traffic exposure on weekends, on highway miles, and also among those 70 and older, it just really emphasizes the need to make sure our airports, vehicles, rail stations, et cetera, are very accessible and can meet their needs as we move forward. Now, just to move very quickly through some of the transportation innovations that we'd like to highlight, um, for one, really underscores the importance of integrating land use and transportation policy. We know that this is good planning, and, and planning, the planning community has been working on mixed-use development, transit-oriented development for many years, and we're getting an increasing amount of data that suggests that this is beneficial to older adults as well. And it can take any form, whether it be very urban, as in Arlington County, Virginia's transit-oriented development, or more rural transit-oriented development that can be found in the state of Washington or Wisconsin. La Crosse, we've heard, has some uh, transit-oriented development going downtown. This is a video that we had hoped to show, but we've told, we're told the technology can be problematic on these webinars, so we won't show it. But I want to invite you to come view this six and a half minute video on our website. And it was filmed to really show 
the benefits of transit-oriented development for older residents in Arlington County, Virginia. And you're very welcome to use this for your own purposes in trying to communicate the message of why we need to do this type of planning. We're hoping that next year we can also shoot a video of rural transit-oriented development. And considering the state of Washington that has an absolutely fabulous inner city bus transportation network, and it's linking that to TOD nodes across the state. So if any of you are calling in from the state of Washington and have ties for us that can help us um, connect with local planners, elected officials, as well as older residents who use this system, we'd really love to hear from you. AARP has been pushing passage of complete streets legislation in a number of our states. We have state offices in each of our states, as well as um, the District of Columbia, Puerto, Puerto Rico. And for those who may not know, a complete street is safe, comfortable, and convenient for travel by all users, regardless of how you choose to get around. And AARP really likes to emphasize regardless of age and ability. And this gets back to some of those earlier slides that older adults, whether they're driving or whether they're pedestrians, they are the most vulnerable users. And we need to be making sure that the street is safe and works for everyone. We also have been doing uh, research and work in the area of human services transportation and in particular the coordination of human services transportation. Now about 5.3 percent of all trips taken by older non-drivers, those are folks 65 and older, are on specialized transportation. If you split that up, it's nearly 60% of all of their public transportation trips um, that are taken on specialized uh, transportation. So we need to be thinking about both making the fixed route public transportation system work better for older users, but we also cannot ignore the fact that many of these folks need this more specialized service to get around. And then also the importance of the private nonprofit sectors in providing rides to older adults. Two-thirds of trips taken by non-drivers 65 and older are passengers and private vehicles. Fen friends and family provide at least a billion trips per year for older relatives, 70 and older, who no longer drive. To the extent that government can support volunteer driver programs, that's a real plus. There are many different forms that these can take in specialized transportation. And then mobility management. This is a new keyword in the transit industry, um, and it, it's hard to describe in simple terms. It really means so much, and it depends on the type of system that an individual jurisdiction puts in place, but it may take the form of a planner or someone acting in the capacity to really be that coordinator to develop local partnerships across the public transportation agencies, human service agencies, uh, even the private sector, nonprofit se sector, to develop those coordinated human services public transportation plans, work through some of the institutional issues that can block good coordination. It also often takes the form of technology and having um, real-time bus information and automated automated scheduling so that various entities that provide specialized or public transportation can share passengers and coordinate those trips in a very effective manner. And it can also take the form of working directly with individuals in the community who need the transportation service to hook them up to the full realm of transportation service that exists in the community. It's not looking at a single mode, but it's looking at the whole cross-section of resources in the community to meet the needs of individuals. So at this point, I want to turn over to a poll. And Ben, I think you have that poll. Yeah. Ben, do I need to give you the keyboard? Um, no. Okay. Yeah.
Ben, do I need to do something to make uh, the poll appear? Oh, uh, it's no. in progress. Okay, yeah. I just don't see it. Okay. Do you want to read the poll? Yeah, sure. For folks who may not have the slides. Okay, uh, the question was, choose the one item that best describes you. Uh, first one, already working in aging po population and planning. Uh, second one was, join to learn and include the needs of aging population in planning. Uh, third one, join to learn but have no plans to work on this issue. Oh, sorry, sorry about the typo. And 64% uh, voted. Uh, first one, we have 15%. Second one, we have 54%. Uh, third, we have 24%. And we have 8% other. And I'll close the poll and send it back to you. OK, well, I have, I believe I've given Rodney the, the mouse. If not, Rodney, do you have control? No, I do not. OK, let me try again. So, okay. Now I think you do. Yeah, you've um, you've on my screen, Jenna. Oh my goodness. Um, hold on one second. It says I'm the presenter, but I don't want to be. So. Mm -hmm. I think you should be the presenter, but give me your keyboard and mouse, please, so I can I should still be the presenter, though. Okay. Okay, now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, we're working this out while I'm being made the presenter here. Um, Jenna, I'll just go ahead and do it from my computer if it's confusing now. All right. Having a little technical difficulties, Jenna and I usually are in the same city uh, doing these things, and I'm actually across the country now. So if uh, someone could just go ahead and put my screen up, and I'll just do it from here. That would be the easiest way. Can you make me the presenter, please? Here we are. So um, thank you, Jana, for that great introduction. And it's great to see that so many of you are already thinking about these issues uh, and working on them, actually. And hopefully those of you in that third category, we can convince to pay attention to the needs of older adults and incorporate those into our communities as we go. Uh, what I'm going to cover are the housing issues uh, specifically here. Um, I'm going to get a little bit of uh, set up first about some of the demographics and then get into some of the solutions that are out there. Uh, first, Jana mentioned uh, our poll of people that uh, want to stay in their communities and how high those numbers are. Well, we have equally or even higher numbers of people who would like to remain in their current residences uh, for as long as possible. And it's, uh, for the 50 plus as a whole, uh, it's in the high 80s. And as you can see here, it moves up over time. Uh, just last week, uh, some of the folks in uh, other folks in ARP's Public Policy Institute uh, released a uh, study. Our, our economics team released a study: uh, Boomers in the Great Recession struggling to recover. And uh, we can see here that uh, a lot of boomers in different categories have a concern of not being able to afford to stay in their home uh, for the rest of their current life. 57% uh, of those employed, uh, almost 80% of those unemployed, and even half of those who are out of the labor force which are pretty much those that are retired or never worked, uh, they're all concerned about their ability uh, to stay in their current home. So uh, the next two things I'm going to talk about are in a study. Uh, you can see here state housing profiles. Uh, we uh, released this late last year, and we covered uh, the entire country in every state and uh, looked at uh, housing affordability and, and other factors. Uh, first, uh, we found out a few interesting things. First of all, we found out that uh, a shift did happen. 
uh, during the last decade. For the first time uh, ever, uh, we now have uh, 50 plus householders uh, more owning with mortgage than without. So that was, to me, one of the biggest shifts I saw. The numbers seem relatively small, uh, but what you can see from this table is the percentage of renters stayed the same, uh, but that's 20% in both years, the blue and the red. But we can see that the uh, percentage of owners uh, uh, with free and clear and, and mortgages have basically uh, switched places here. Uh, this is one of the things that I think older adults are doing to try to uh, survive in the uh, current uh, recession and aftermath. Right. Let's see here. Uh, now here's a nationwide map. You can see that uh, this isn't the same uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, you can see that we've got higher percentages in the, uh, in the west. Uh, we've got lower percentages in the uh, Plain States and, and the, uh, excuse me, and part of the South, Texas and, and surrounding states. Uh, so, uh, and also the Northeast and the Washington DC region. So you see a lot of the areas of the country that have very high housing costs are places where more 50 plus householders are owned with mortgages. Uh, these are folks that have uh, tried to adapt to uh, the cost in their area perhaps uh, by uh, taking on more mortgage debt over that time. And uh, now this chart is a little complicated, uh, but I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I'm hoping you can see my mouse there. Uh, these four groups are the income groups by quartile. Uh, with these are all 25% of the population. And so uh, focusing on that lowest 25% uh, of the population, uh, we expected to see that uh, renters would have a high housing cost burdens. By the way, housing cost burdens are those that uh, spend more than 30% on housing. Uh, this is that 30% threshold is a standard in the housing field, and uh, we see that as the percentage of people uh, that uh, can afford their housing but also are able to pay for any of life's other emergencies or, or costs. So all of these people on this chart are paying more than 30%. And so we expected the renters to be high. You see that in the lowest quartile, 78%, and in the next quartile, 48% of uh, renters uh, are having this housing cost burden. But what was surprising was that nearly all uh, of homeowners with mortgages in that lowest quartile and uh, two-thirds of those in that second quartile uh, are, have housing cost burdens. Uh, so if you're not a higher income person and you see the, uh, these two on the right-hand side are people with higher incomes, they're relatively uh, okay. Uh, but for folks on uh, this side of the, uh, of the in on this lower side of the income mix, it's a great deal of uh, hardship and trouble. Now, uh, one thing I'd really want to point out to those of you uh, in the audience that aren't familiar with these numbers is that 49% of homeowners without mortgages, those that are free and clear, have a housing cost burden. So even if you paid off your mortgage and you're in your house outright, uh, still have energy costs, property taxes, uh, repairs, etc. And for those people in that lowest group, it's almost half of those homeowners uh, that don't have mortgages. So uh, simply paying off your mortgage doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you're uh, not a victim or, or not, uh, uh, not affected by these housing costs. Uh, so we need to really pay attention to all of those groups as we look at these issues. Now the next here is this one here. Okay. The next one here uh, are the uh, show that housing cost burdens are worsening, and they're worsening for every group. You can see here uh, 2000 is in blue and 2009 is in red. And simply put, for each of these income levels, the red bars are higher. That means that more people at the end of uh, 2009 uh, had housing cost burden than before. Another thing that shifted uh, was uh, composition of households uh, due to uh, a range of factors. I tie it mostly to the uh, increased divorce rate and the increased longevity uh, for men. Uh, relative to women. Uh, we do have more men living alone from 10 to 13 percent over that time, and we have a, uh, a slight drop in the married couples. Uh, and we have a, uh, the other women living alone has also uh, dropped slightly, and other households has grown slightly. So 
Uh, what this draws attention to is the fact that most older adults do live in relatively small households, uh, one or two person households, and so uh, those are the households we're talking about. They're not necessarily as large as the households that younger families have. Uh, another issue we covered were disability rates. Uh, the way that the Census Bureau asked these questions changed, so we couldn't get into uh, a comparison uh, before and after. But as we can see here, uh, that renters have higher uh, uh, disability rates than older than um, homeowner households, and also that older adults have higher rates. Uh, but even still, if you're talking about 65 plus renters, which are the highest category, only 54 percent have a a disability by the measure that the Census Bureau used here. And so that means that there are a great number that are dealing with physical disability, uh, but a great number that aren't at, at the current time as well. And uh, you can see that those disability rates are also uh, varied across the country. Uh, that uh, for those in the South, uh, those are relatively high uh, and uh, less so in some other regions of the country. So what's in those state housing profiles, if you go to that website, are the numbers for your state. You can look at every state and, uh, and you can see what uh, is going on for your community. Uh, another study that we've done a couple of years ago was this one on uh, increasing home access design for visibility. It was our look at trying to uh, make homes that work for older adults. Uh, one of our largest strategies on the housing side is given that uh, some older adults have those physical disabilities, uh, some don't, uh, but will have the later. Uh, and generally, the people have a wide range of needs. Uh, we wanted to figure out a way to make homes uh, work for a range of people. Uh, so I'm going to get into how to do that uh, in a second here. Uh, first of all, these uh, ways to do that go by many different names, lifespan homes, uh, livable homes, inclusive design, visitable homes. These are all uh, brand names or different varieties of names that you might hear uh, describing homes that meet universal design principles. And, and those principles are uh, simply that, uh, that a home or any other thing that's universally designed will work for all users without adaptation or special design. These are not necessarily homes that have ramps or uh, medical style uh, facilities for access and accessibility, uh, but these are homes that have the basic structural features that uh, will allow anyone to live there. Uh, now, there are a range of different ways to do all of this uh, to get these into homes. Uh, you can do them through mandates. Uh, for example, uh, Pima County, Arizona requires that all homes have uh, visitability features. And so all homes that have been built there since that law has been passed uh, require uh, those features. Uh, you can require it of just homes that are built with government funding assistance. Uh, that's using the logic that if, we're, if tax dollars are involved, we need to build homes that work for uh, the widest range of people to be a better steward of our resources. So that logic works in, in some places. Uh, our friends in the building community uh, prefer that middle column, the voluntary incentives. Uh, those range from partial reimbursement of uh, housing costs, of the cost of, of adding these features, uh, tax incentives, uh, tax credits, things along those lines, uh, expedited permitting, which uh, is probably one of the, the, uh, the least difficult one, things to implement. Uh, it's free for uh, uh, local governments to do, but it gives an um, incentive for uh, builders and the like to uh, add these features. And then simple designation programs. These, again, cost nothing, uh, but just simply by designating a home as a uh, home for all ages or a home for living or uh, whatever brand name your community comes up with uh, may encourage uh, some builders uh, to do that. Uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania is one of those areas that I think has done some good work in that area. And finally, the option uh, of information campaigns, uh, California requires a checklist of options uh, be given to all people that are uh, getting a, uh, building a new home. All, the builder has to provide uh, uh, several sheets of paper that list universal design options and you check those off. Uh, 
sometimes those programs are not as effective as we would hope uh, because people don't have the awareness or uh, understanding of how these features can benefit them. Uh, so the second item in this column is equally or perhaps more important, and those are educational campaigns to let individuals and builders know uh, what, about what they're doing, and that's also some, a large piece of the work uh, that AERP does. Now, what am I talking about when I talk about universal design and, and, and creating these things? Well, I'm going to give you two examples here. One, visitability. Now, visitability, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is uh, one of the more popular schemes to get more universal design features into homes. There are three main features, a zero-step entrance, uh, access to a bathroom on the first floor that has uh, at least a, a five-foot turning radius. So, for example, someone with a wheelchair or a walker could maneuver within that bathroom. And 32-inch clear openings of doorways and hallways. So what that means is someone that's, again, using a mobility device such as a walker or wheelchair can get through the hallways, they can get into the home, they can use the restroom. Uh, now, proponents love this uh, because it's easy to understand, it's easy to explain to legislatures, and it makes the argument that we're making these design changes not just for someone with disabilities, uh, but in case anyone in that home is visited. Uh, by someone in the community, uh, they need to, to get in there. So uh, that's some of the logic that's worked with that uh, proposal. Now, uh, one of the new varieties of this that ARP is working on is uh, the inclusive home design. Now, you see it's many of the, the, all three of those same features from visitability, but we've included uh, basic access to a full bath on the ground floor, not just a half bath habitable interior space, which means a bedroom or room that can be used as a bedroom on the first floor, a kitchen that has those same spacing uh, design features, basically an open design that allows uh, maneuvering inside there, and uh, lighting controls at reasonable heights. Uh, if you've ever been in uh, a hotel ballroom or any uh, place that has to uh, live up to Fair Housing Act or uh, ADA, uh, excuse me, ADA requirements, you'll see that they have outlets that are higher uh, than the ones that are usually at your home. Uh, those, the reason that your outlets are seven inches or so from the ground are only because it's just the way it's always been done. There's no reason why uh, the uh, electric outlets can't be a little higher and perhaps some of those controls uh, for light switches and the like could be low enough that people could reach whether they're standing, whether they're sitting uh, in a chair or a wheelchair or what have you. Uh, so those are the lighting controls. But you see here that we've created a, uh, a scheme that allows communities to build a home that not only can someone visit, but someone can live in there. So for us, this is a kind of a, a step up, uh, and it's also a step up in difficulty uh, in getting uh, these things approved, but a step up in terms of uh, what we're getting people in these homes. Uh, this is just a summary of our... Uh, of our model legislation. Uh, what we did is we based it on the International Code Council and, and ANSI, American National Standards Institute standards uh, from 2009. Uh, so it's based within uh, industry accepted standards. And so for all the things I mentioned on the earlier page, we've got uh, particular specific standards that are backed by that uh, body. Uh, so they're not just standards that ARP came up with, but these are industry developed. And we're just asking that cities, communities, counties, et cetera, uh, include them into what they're, they uh, require for housing. Uh, but why are these issues important? And I, I go to the trusty APA policy guide on housing, uh, that it's not just for people that are uh, elderly or older adults and with physical disabilities. It's for people without disabilities and, and children as well. It's much easier to push a stroller or even to carry a, a big screen TV and if you've got wide doorways and a zero-step entrance. So these are uh, the kinds of features that really just make homes usable for all. And that's really the theme behind universal design. Uh, the next thing I'm going to cover is uh, more of the housing location piece. Uh, this is another study that we did a little while back. We were looking at how important location of housing was to older adults, particularly uh, those that were with low incomes. Uh, in different cities and in subsidized housing. And we found out some interesting uh, things there, and I'll just touch on those quickly. 
uh, two examples. One from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, now I'm hoping again that you can see my mouse here. That uh, there was uh, one site, uh, Summer with Common, which was more outside uh, town. But this one here, we looked at Coleman Court on the right side, number two here. Uh, you can see the site is that light blue circle. The um, that inner circle is a quarter mile radius from that transit site. Uh, the half mile circle is a little lighter. The blue lines are the uh, bus lines that run at least 15 minutes every day, and the orange actually represents the actual trail line, the rail line. And you can see that this site looked perfectly located. It was right on top of a rail line, about uh, 100 yards or so. Uh, it was near a bus line. So this was to be my great example of how transit location could work. And what I found out was that that wasn't necessarily the case. Here's a close-up of that area. Uh, first here is Coleman Court, uh, right next to St. Coleman's Church. Here's the West 65 uh, Rapid uh, Transit Line, again, right across the parking lot. And, um, and so here's, uh, again, looks like a perfect setup. But what did I see when I got onto the ground? Uh, first, number one here, you can see that there's a great uh, designed uh, ADA accessible entrance that they uh, added that had um, only recently uh, been put on when I went to visit there, uh, put together. Uh, but to get there, you had to go through number three, if you look at the map here, Lawn Avenue, which even at the outset of the recession and housing crisis had uh, boarded up buildings. Uh, these shade trees provide uh, some shade during the day, but during night there's, the street is not very well lit. And there's a story uh, popular in the building that someone had been robbed there at some point. So because of that, very few of the residents wanted to actually go down uh, Lawn, Lawn Avenue. So that seemed to be okay. If you go out the other side here of the complex, right outside Madison, there's a, an entrance right there, the secondary entrance. But then uh, number two here uh, is a picture of Madison Avenue. Uh, and you can see the beat up sidewalk and here in the back, you can sort of see the little green staircase uh, that uh, now Google Maps took this picture on a, on a nice day. And the reason I use that is because when I went there, it was raining. And that metal rusted staircase that goes down about uh, 50 feet or so is uh, dangerous and slick. And uh, I didn't go down there. And I can imagine what it would be to someone that is not uh, physically able. So. Uh, the long and short of it is fear of crime and uh, safety issues at that point in time turn this potentially great location uh, into one that didn't work. Now, on the other hand, uh, we went to Minneapolis. And I'm going to talk about one site here, Nicolette Towers, uh, specifically. And as you can see here, it's in downtown Minneapolis uh, with lots of things around it. And uh, it's actually just outside of the radius that we normally would look at for uh, trans-oriented development, but uh, what we found is that it was very useful for the folks there. Again, here's the map. Uh, Nicolette Towers is here on the lower right-hand side. Nicolette Mall is a restricted access uh, pedestrian and uh, taxi cab and bus uh, way, uh, so no other traffic is, is allowed on, those, on that street. So, uh, and there's a light rail station right at the end of it. Uh, now, what we found when we went there was that uh, we had several people in that building that used the light rail on a daily basis. Uh, those people, and those are two women that were 85 or 80 plus, one was 85 plus, that used it on a, on a near, daily or nearly daily basis. And we said, well, this is a great example. Now, why are they doing that? Uh, by the way, for those of you that aren't familiar with downtown Minneapolis, the convention center is up here on the right. You see the basketball ring on the left. And this part of downtown has uh, the opera house. There's uh, a large church here. There's uh, shops, restaurants, and, and some businesses right along uh, this pathway. So uh, here's on the ground photos. Uh, in the top left corner is uh, Nicolette Towers itself. You see one of the, the buses uh, right there. On the, uh, below that, you see a gentleman riding his bicycle at, at a quiet time on the street. And he's very easily uh, using that roadway uh, to do that. Uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see you can sort of see the cafes and the benches and uh, what not on the left side of that picture. I see a couple of buses and you see some of the, the people, the activity going on there. And in the upper right-hand corner, 
uh, you'll see uh, a farmer's market. Uh, that picture was actually taken um, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, you can see that some of those activities that are uh, in that area. And so what we found was that through this design of having uh, subsidized housing, housing that worked for older adults here, uh, so that low-income older adults were able to participate and uh, take advantage of all of those things that are along Nicolet Mall, uh, but also uh, that design. There's places to sit. There's places to stop. Uh, there are wide sidewalks. There's uh, low traffic. All of those things allow people uh, to get to the transit on a regular basis. So it was one of the most successful places that we visited. Uh, and, uh, and I recommend uh, that, that uh, planners take a look at it as a good example. So what were our general conclusions here? Uh, basically, this chart tells us that uh, those areas on the left have minimal benefits uh, from locating housing near transit. Uh, if you, an individual with uh, significant physical limitations and, and the system hasn't addressed those physical limitations, you can't wait for transit very long, uh, that's a problem. Uh, those who can't, who don't speak English and don't have uh, signs in their language or those who can't understand the complicated uh, signage within the system, they have a problem uh, using transit and they don't get full benefit. In an economically struggling community, if you don't have shopping and services near to your homes, you don't benefit. And uh, poor transit service, including bus drivers who won't stop, uh, poor route planning, unreliable service, uh, inaccessible stop stations, high crime levels, all of those things will keep people uh, inside as well. I'm doing this call from Miami right now, and uh, when we came here for our study, uh, we, uh, and this was also in 2009, we found out that at that point, if you recall, large complexes that we looked at there had just had their bus service cut off. So those folks, uh, and, they're, and on top of that, they're in a community that was in a higher crime area, so they were gated in and didn't really have good pedestrian access to begin with. So I felt that those folks were pretty much trapped in that community uh, from my observer standpoint uh, because of the, uh, the poor bus service uh, that existed. I mainly complained that even when they did have buses come by, that uh, buses would pass them by. And it's 90 degrees right now here, and I can imagine on a summer day, uh, if you're an older adult waiting for a, a bus that takes an hour to get there, you might not um, want to try it too often if the buses aren't coming on a regular basis. Uh, now, who benefits well? Well, in those areas where individuals are open to transit, there any cognitive or physical impairments are addressed, signage is clear in whatever languages uh, it needs to be and easy to understand, those address all those individual limitations. In well-planned, safe, healthy communities and walkable neighborhoods with resources nearby and uh, basically good transit systems, those are areas uh, where people benefit from those locations. So on the housing side for us, it's not only a matter of making sure that housing works for people's physical needs, it's a matter of making that housing is affordable uh, for people at all levels of income. But finally, it's making sure the housing are in locations uh, that work for people. Those are kind of the three pegs of what's important from the housing standpoint. Now, earlier, uh, Jana mentioned uh, a couple of reports. You've seen a few that I've mentioned here as well. I want to encourage all of you uh, to head to our new website. Uh, it's at aerp.org slash ppi slash live-com. You can see it there on your screen, and there's a little screenshot there. Uh, the video that we can show you is, is uh, one of those uh, four boxes at the top. Uh, we've got all of our publications here. Uh, we've got uh, policy discussion and some other resources there as well. So it's a great resource for all of you. You can find things like state housing profiles, our multi-generational housing fact sheet, uh, Jana's Complete Streets report, our aging uh, place report with examples uh, from states across the country. All of those things are at that site. So please uh, go ahead and take a look. Uh, now finally, uh, aside from the Public Policy Institute, ARP is a huge organization. And so we have a, a range of other programs. I only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to talk about one of those and uh, one that ties to our policy work here, and that's our AIDS-Friendly uh, Communities Program. Uh, that ARP has become an affiliate of the WHO uh, 
global program to create age-friendly cities and communities. Uh, we're active in a few uh, states across the country uh, and, and encouraging uh, communities to become uh, age-friendly. Now, uh, the network started with just major cities internationally, uh, but now it's at a level uh, that communities, counties uh, can apply, communities of any size, and they have to make a commitment to be a community that's going to prepare themselves for the aging population. So do you have uh, complete streets policies? Do you have uh, visitability or in your housing? Do you have work on uh, some of these other areas which I'll actually show here? You'll see that uh, outdoor spaces and buildings are in there as well. Social participation uh, is in there. Is there a way for older adults to be included into uh, the civic uh, life in the community? Uh, health services, et cetera. Uh, you know, there are some cities that have done this, New York City, uh, Portland, Oregon, Philadelphia. Uh, in Georgia, we've just had uh, Macon, I believe, uh, it's one of those communities that just come on recently. So it's uh, some big cities, some smaller places. Uh, but uh, what we're encouraging is for folks on all levels to think about uh, making their communities work for older adults in each of these, uh, each of the uh, WHO domains here. Uh, which go wider than housing, transportation, and land use, and really include all of the areas that impact life. Uh, one of those cities that I, we think did a good job is uh, New York City. Uh, they have 59 different initiatives from senior hours at the pool to creating uh, safe places to sit everywhere uh, throughout the city, uh, taxi vouchers for those who would otherwise be eligible for paratransit services, those who have physical disabilities and need to get around. Uh, emergency alert system for missing older adults. And they had a range of things that are useful, and uh, they're, they're a good example, I think, for other communities. Uh, right here, you can see how to join the network. Uh, there's no fee. Uh, a letter from a municipal leader kicks off the process. At, at that joining stage, it's just a commitment uh, to work on these issues and to reach out to older adults within the community and figure out what the issues are and then to, uh, to work on them. Uh, within 24 months after joining the network, you create an advisory committee, you uh, develop and post your action plan on how to address these issues, and, uh, and then there's an evaluation period after that. And then for the next three years, uh, you implement that action plan. And so, it's, so altogether, it's a way to perhaps organize some of those efforts uh, to make your community work better for older adults. Now, I believe we have one other poll question. Uh, can we pull that up now? Yeah. Great. So this poll question, we wanted to look at uh, if any of the things we've mentioned today are things that your community is working on, whether it's universal design, complete streets, human services, transportation, transit-oriented development, or others. So please go ahead and fill that out, and we'll take about a minute or so uh, to let you do that. It was great. I'm seeing the things come in here, and I'm seeing that um, we have a good number of you uh, that have others. And I'm curious. We'll put our contact information at the end. I'm curious for uh, if those of you could send me some examples of uh, of what other what's in that other category. I'd love to see it. Why don't we go ahead and close that up, Ben? It's been about a minute. Okay. And uh, we have what 12 percent. Uh, you have universal design, 61% have complete streets policies, 49% human services transportation uh, coordination policies, uh, again 49% uh, TOD, and 13% are in that other category. So uh, I expect uh, to hear from 13% of you later. But it's great to see that so many of you are working on in these areas, and I'm hoping that you have people of all ages uh, included in your design uh, process, your consult, your consulting about what the needs are, and, uh, and that your end products work for people of all ages. Okay, so uh, finally we're, we're ready for questions. Uh, our contact information is here. You've got our email addresses. You can also find me on Twitter, Facebook, uh, at Dr. Urban Policy. 
and at uh, you can I have a blog at uh, drurbanpolicy.blogspot.com as well where I blog about uh, these uh, urban issues generally. Uh, also, there's our AERP Public Policy Institute website again, our general email address, and uh, the ARP Foundation's housing uh, email address. Uh, the people in the ARP Foundation uh, work on uh, housing issues as well, and they're developing some great programs, so I encourage you to go look at their website and see what they're doing uh, as well. So with that, uh, we're going to open up uh, for questions. I see that some of you have uh, been submitting questions as we go along, but uh, those of you uh, that haven't done so, uh, please uh, go ahead and write your questions in the chat box. And, uh, and if we run out of time, uh, feel free to send questions via Twitter or, or one of the other uh, um, avenues after the fact, and then we'll try to get to you. So, uh, Jana, have you been reading some of the questions? Do you see some that we want to answer? Yeah, let me uh, start with two questions for you, Rodney, and these are focused on universal design visibility uh, discussion. And the, I'm just going to ask both of these questions at once. The first is, what proportion, I, I'm sorry, does the International Building Code have elements that can be adopted locally that make homes compliant with universal design? I think you covered that, but just to be sure, um, answer that question, followed by, um, the Local Home Builders Association is resistant, resisting mandated requirements. Often they mention additional costs to comply with the code. Does the visibility design standards add additional costs to projects? Those are two great questions on, on universal design issues uh, generally. Uh, let me start with the, the second one first. That, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the home, there's many members of the National Association of Home Builders. Some, uh, really get the issues, some uh, not as much. And in the end, I think uh, uh, one of the big problems that we see is that uh, they'll argue, they argue that uh, the cost isn't, isn't there to justify, or the costs are high and they worry about whether there's enough demand to deal with the cost. And, and I think we can help with both of those issues from the side. One, uh, uh, well first, is that what we're asking for are things that don't require a great deal of cost. There are some studies out there on, on the additional cost uh, of, uh, of visibility features that, uh, depending on the size of and, and the uh, size of the, the structure and the, uh, the foundation or no foundation, uh, in some cases we're talking a few hundred dollars. Uh, the folks at SUNY Buffalo have a great uh, piece on this, and I can't recall the uh, the name of it right now, but. Uh, Maybe we'll put that later in the, when we put the um, presentation out. But, uh, but the costs are, are not really high for these issues. That's one of the things that we've talked about. And that's why we've used the, uh, the ICC ANSI standards uh, to do this. Um, now, builders are, have a large role in those code councils and how those standards are developed. So the things that are in, the, in that code don't have a big issue. Now, the International Building Code is slightly different. It, um, isn't something that we've looked at specifically. So uh, it, it, I believe, though, it does have uh, some elements that, that could be adopted in this format. Uh, but those of you that have adopted the International uh, Building Code standards, uh, they do not have, say, a fully designed, laid out uh, way to say if, if you've done this one section or, or implemented that, you have universal design. Uh, it's not as clear cut. Uh, the second question. All right, that was it. So that was, the, that was both sides of the question. Yeah, and the, this, the next question I'll take a stab at um, initially, and then Rodney, you can join in. But the question is, are there any differences in needs for housing and transportation for boomers, or I'm going to expand that to older than boomers in mid-sized cities um, versus larger cities in rural and small town areas? Any unique challenges in mid-sized cities, uh, such as Orlando, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Flagstaff, Arizona, et cetera? So let me just start off and really putting on my lens of the transportation planner here. I think the, the various mobility challenges that people face as a result of aging, as a result of disability, et cetera, they don't necessarily vary um, 
based on where one chooses to live, whether that's a large urban area or a small mid-sized city versus a rural area, suburb, etc. However, the range of transportation options that exist in these locations, of course, does vary. And the types of transportation options that can be provided at an affordable price and it, it can vary as well. So for instance, um, obviously older adults living in larger cities have access to better public transportation, at least more service exists. Now there can be barriers, as Rodney pointed out in his presentation, to accessing that service even where it exists. So those types of considerations need to be made. Um, Mid-sized cities, of course, you're balancing lower density housing and perhaps a different scale of mixed-use development, which can limit the tra transit choices that can be put out on the street, although we're seeing many mid-sized cities that are putting light rail service into effect. And, and part of the increase in public transportation use that we've seen in the United States over the past decade, I think we've seen that a lot of that is coming from those mid-sized cities, that they are getting rail systems and they're improving their bus systems, and so it, people are taking better advantage of that. Um, but if we start looking at rural areas and more of the outlined suburban areas that aren't well served by public transportation, there is a different um, set of solutions that may make more sense. It goes back to volunteer driver programs. Um, and, and again, that those could be challenging to find enough drivers. As gas prices rise, we know that finding volunteer drivers can become increasingly challenging. Um, I think in all of the cases, some of what I'm looking at right now in providing transportation, especially specialized transportation, is really the need, whether you're in an urban area or a rural area, or somewhere in between for really focusing in on that coordinated services side and forming those relationships in order to go beyond just kind of talking to the regular people we as planners may talk, talk with and really extending that network in order to see what other resources can we bring to the table. So for instance, um, I was in South Dakota this summer on a site visit and looking at rural public transportation services. And one of the really interesting things that's happening in the rural areas surrounding Sioux Falls is that their rural public transit provider is connecting with the hospitals, with the human services providers, to schedule transit service from a rural part of the state to Sioux Falls certain days of the week offering a discounted rate price for that trip and working with in hospitals what are called, um, they could be coordinators or mobility managers or nurse practitioners, but people who are looking out for the patient for their whole treatment program, say if they're a cancer patient or something, and scheduling appointments to coincide with people coming from out of town with that bus service. So it's really extending those networks out to the private sector to, to find other, other means. There's also innovations um, where the funding sources from the federal government can be much better tied together. South Dakota not only requires, as it part of its coordinated human services public transportation planning process, that funding under the FTA, Federal Transit Administration programs, be a part of this coordinated plan, but they require that the funding that's coming through their, the Older Americans Act, the Title III-B funding, um, often that goes to the Area Agency on Aging, also come through the Department of Transportation so it can be coupled with the FTA money and put out there into communities. So the result is that where once you had a human service agency that was able to get seniors to the senior center um, or adult daycare center, um, but no, providing no other service, they've been able to put a public transit provider that's serving the entire community, pulling various pots of FTA funding, getting the human services transportation funding. So now those seniors can not only get to the senior centers, 
but they can get to any other location in this small town. And, and that example I'm giving is um, Wall, South Dakota, not a large community whatsoever. So these are some innovations and uh, something that we really want to see more of on the human services transportation side. So Rodney, that was kind of a long-winded answer. Do you want to add from the housing oh. side? Yeah, I mean, I think you covered, you, in, the, in the beginning, I think you covered a lot of the issues for housing. So I'll just add another dynamic. For me, often, the difference on the housing side isn't so much between large cities and medium-sized cities, uh, but uh, the region or, or location of the city and the economic condition of the city. That's something to think about uh, as well. So if you're in uh, you know, a, a Rust Belt city, uh, let's say, you know, Flint, Michigan, or Detroit, or a uh, type of place where you've got a lot of uh, people that have, young people that have left the community, and uh, large numbers of vacancies, and uh, older adults being the dominant uh, people that are left in a particular neighborhood, uh, you've got huge isolation issues there. Uh, that's one thing, uh, one of the things I'm largely concerned about, that uh, if you're on a city block that you've been on for 30 or 40 years and all of a sudden you're one of three people on that block of 20 homes, you're not only costing the city a lot in services, and, and some cities are actually trying to take steps to address that, uh, but you're also uh, just more isolated socially, uh, so some of those uh, social effects and impacts come from that and, and uh, fear of crime and all the like uh, that can happen. Uh, and uh, uh, in better off cities, you see uh, a, a little less of that, uh, that uh, there's also uh, tends to be more money to, to actually use for some of these housing programs. So you've got to be a little more inventive when there's uh, not as much uh, money to be spent. And uh, so you see uh, a lot of the cities without uh, a, a lot of financial stability doing some of these policies that are, are low or no cost. I went through some of the, that list earlier on the uh, housing uh, accessibility side and the universal design section, but uh, the ones that have no cost are the ones that appeal the most, I think, to uh, communities uh, uh, that have um, have lower budgets. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily always compare yourself to cities of equal size, but sometimes you need to compare yourself to cities with the same similar conditions to what you have. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, another question. This is. Following up on an earlier question, very related, but what are the most effective strategies, options for improving transportation for seniors in a sprawling, medium-sized urban area? And um, the questioner suggests, is it taxi vouchers, circulating vans, other innovations? And I think um, there are a number of things. If you're setting the public transit system aside, well, before I do that, the let's assume there is some form of fixed route public transportation in the community and it may not run frequently, but one thing that some, a few communities have tried, including uh, Prince William County in Virginia, is a flex type of system where the bus is scheduled as a fixed route service, but with enough padded time in the schedule that if someone calls in advance to say, can you come and pick me up in front of my house, the bus can veer off its route and do that. And that can be very helpful to older adults in the community. It's not a service that's all that possible in an urban area on an urban fixed route system just because of traffic and the need to keep uh, to schedule and the more frequent service, et cetera. But it is something on those um, farther out areas that can be very effective. Um, also, other types of transit broadly defined uh, services that may be providers that are not fixed route providers but more paratransit providers also you know, broadly defined. They may be the area agencies on aging or other uh, human service agencies. If you can get the technology in order for a centralized uh, scheduling and dispatch service, then those buses, those vehicles that go out can um, reach out and pick up passengers for various human service agencies and we're seeing more and more of this. Um, there, there are of course taxi voucher programs. These are very effective for outlying areas that can be uh, income based or 
you know, other in age-based type of criteria and can provide uh, service very personalized, well, at least uh, the private vehicle type of service for older adults. Um, that assumes there are taxi companies in the community that can provide that service. Um, and then there's some, uh, some good innovations out there, um, volunteer driver programs, uh, PACE program, Riverside, California. They have um, funding for drivers to take older adults around but the older adults get to choose who they want to drive them around. So they basically recruit their own drivers, whether it be family or friends, but there's some reimbursement possibility there. Um, there's a lot of innovations going on in the Portland area, um, Ride Connection, where they work with church groups, they uh, work with the um, TriMet, which is the metro uh, transit provider to teach older adults how to use the public transit system. Um, they have a number of agreements with other human service agencies, a volunteer driver program. So there's, there's quite a few. Uh, I don't know that there's any one thing that works better than others. It's often really looking at the resources in your community and thinking out of the box and seeing what can be done. Hey, Jenna, I'll, take the, I'll see a question here I'll, I'll, I'll take. Uh, and that was one uh, where I was asked, uh, uh, have you seen increases in the use of echo housing and mother-daughter apartments to accommodate older parents in existing housing? How receptive are communities to modifying their zoning to accommodate such housing? And uh, that's a, uh, a good question. Uh, now, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, echo housing uh, was a particular uh, program, uh, the Elder Cottage Housing Opportunity Program, uh, started in the 80s, uh, and it was a a small house for uh, an older adult that was placed uh, kind of near uh, the home of a host family, usually probably a relative or a close friend. Um, and there were uh, some, I think, some administrative issues and some other uh, problems uh, that kept that from uh, being as successful as it uh, could have been. And in part, uh, zoning uh, was a big issue. And, uh, making this question wider, uh, those of you may be familiar with uh, accessory dwelling units, and we have a, um, a great model uh, accessory dwelling unit uh, laws available on our website as well, uh, that zoning is often the biggest thing that precludes uh, these units from being built where they're needed and could be used. Uh, that the whole concept of building a unit for uh, an older adult or anyone else on a property is uh, sometimes uh, met with some fears uh, by many community, whether it's traffic, uh, lowering property values, uh, et cetera. Uh, there are many excuses that are uh, justifications that are used. Uh, and in most cases, I, I think those can be mitigated uh, by communities that have the will to, to do so. Uh, but uh, now in terms of the households themselves, We've, we tried to look long and hard for uh, golden girl households and some of these other things that we hear trends about, and we just have not seen the evidence so far that those things are growing in, in great numbers, uh, those kind of uh, specialized households, at least not uh, to the point where they're showing up in, in the uh, studies that we've looked at uh, yet. Uh, but I think looking forward, uh, when we see that the uh, baby boom generation is coming uh, that, uh, in great numbers, uh, we'll start to see all of those options. I mean, uh, all the housing options under the rainbow, I think, will start to become more popular. Uh, by the way, I'll answer another question quickly I see here that about what we mean by baby boomers. Now, all this, uh, when I use it, I, I, and I think this goes for Jane as well, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm uh, using the uh, general definition of people that are born between uh, 1945 and 64. I think all the studies we looked at use that definition. Right. Jana, did you have one, or do you want me to take another one? I um, haven't. Okay. Let's look here. I'm seeing the question, what proportion of the disability rates are due to obesity? And there was another related question later uh, that I can't see right now. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I have heard of researchers who are um, suggesting that as the 
given the, the nation's weight, that, that the, the declining trends in disability rates may be reversed, um, but I don't know who to point in that, to in that direction for research. Rodney, do you have more information? No, I think it's a, it's a need that's out there, actually, uh, that, that we haven't touched on ourselves and, and we're uh, looking for others uh, to, to really uh, help kind of get those research areas covered. Uh, uh, let me, uh, right now, uh, say for that last poll, I see now that some of you are mentioning that in the last poll you answered other because uh, that we didn't have a none of the above option in the last poll. So uh, maybe that explains some of the, the high numbers we had for other in that last poll. And, um, and it's okay if your community is not doing any of those things now, but hopefully uh, you go back to your communities and, and start to implement some of these things as we go. And, and I should mention that, you know, we've focused on more of the traditional planning areas that can address uh, the aging demographic from land use, transportation, housing type of solutions, and try to draw some connections to things that planners are already doing in many communities, but may not be doing those through the lens of aging. And so I think you can increase, if you already are implementing complete streets or transit-oriented development, you can increase your effectiveness by taking some of this information and filtering it through the lens of aging to say, what do I need to know for the next generation, which is going to be an older population? So things, you know, with designing the street network, um, it's still uh, fairly rare, my encounters with communities that are working on complete streets, for them to have really explicitly recognized that older adults are the most vulnerable users in the community. Um, children are up there, but in terms of fatality statistics, they, they are not as affected as the oldest in the, in the community. And so we do need to keep this population group in mind as part of any planning effort. Um, something else I was going to mention with that, oh, and outside of the traditional planning realms of land use, housing, transportation, as Rodney pointed out through the Age-Friendly Communities Program, there are these other, you know, seven domains or several domains, and the there's a number of things. The New York Academy of Medicine, I believe it is, that's teamed up with um, the Age-Friendly Communities Program is really spelling out a number of these other areas that can be worked on. So again, as planners, I think we are in a great position because we tend to be generalists. We tend to be big picture people and we understand the public process and we can convene and facilitate and, and moderate these types of discussions. And so I think planners can take the lead, but it's really getting outside the, the formal planning discipline and reaching out to new networks. Um, I think every local government planner should be in contact with the director of the Area Agency on Aging locally. They, we as planners need to know what are the issues older adults are facing in the community and start brainstorming how can we begin to affect those through the work that we do. Um, and, and there's many other types of organizations out there like that. That's a great answer. And um, I, I see we're getting close to the end here. We have maybe time for a couple more. A uh, couple of things I wanted to do. Uh, first, I, I, don't, I wanted to make sure to thank uh, those of you from the National Capital Area uh, chapter and the uh, Planning the Black Community Division that have signed on. Uh, I'm on the board of the uh, Planning the Black Community Division, and uh, I know we're happy to co-sponsor the series, so I wanted to make sure to mention that. Uh, there was a question here about uh, you know, whether there are trends in downtown living and senior population or intergenerational communities. And that reminds me of, of one thing that I wanted to, to make sure to, to kind of say here towards the end, and that's that, uh, again, building off Jana's last point, as planners, we're in a unique position, uh, I think, to prepare and to look at communities in the long term, and uh, and also uh, though to to help uh, deal with issues uh, as they are now. And as I look at the housing issues for older adults, for boomers, and and beyond, I think two things: one, that we have to that there's a short-term problem that we've got 
lots of older adults now in homes and communities that don't meet their needs. And then, uh, right now is the time to find these solutions uh, that we can use to help mitigate that. Uh, that uh, whether it's uh, whether it's a home that's in a bad location, so maybe there's some transportation solution or, or some a way to bring in services or what have you to do that. Uh, that's um, something a you know, short-term solution. Uh, from the ground level, uh, you may be familiar with the Beacon Hill Village example. Uh, now these villages are sprouting up all over the country, and these are neighborhood groups of people that are coming together and uh, creating services within their community uh, to help make up for the fact that their community doesn't have what they need or doesn't provide them uh, with what they, they have. Um, now long term, we've talked about this a lot today, but I think we have the role of putting in front of the people that need to hear it uh, the things that need, to, that need time to, to uh, happen. So when we're talking about changing the way housing is built, you know, that's a two to three decade at least process to really change the way uh, you know, homes are or community design issues or what have you. And if you think back to Jana's slides about the population growth, well, we're talking within the next couple of decades that we're going to have that huge explosion. So I can't overexpress the urgency uh, that we would need in, uh, in taking uh, this issue uh, seriously. And, and I hope, and I'm glad that the session was so popular at the uh, APA conference, and we've adapted it uh, and, and broadened it a little bit for, for all of you folks today. Uh, and I hope that it, we don't just have those people that um, have focused on older adult issues here, but I hope that we have a, a wide range of folks that uh, you know, are going to take some of these issues uh, back to their communities and work with them. Uh, because we need both short and long-term solutions. Now, to this person's question, in the, in the long term, I mean, there are things like uh, co-housing that we've looked at, um, intergenerational households and the like. Uh, those things are, are small and niche, and even downtown living they're, uh, for older adults. They're relatively small now, but they're growing. And I believe that, obviously, when we, uh, when the, oh, when we have the great number of, of older adults being 65 plus and that Kind of range, you'll see more and more of them taking on these options. Uh, there's a wide range of things that may always be a niche, but that pool of people is so large that we're going to see a lot more people doing it. So, and, and but also to underscore that, you know, one of the main trends that we want people to keep in mind is that the great majority of older adults tell us that they want to age in their current homes and communities. So while we do see some um, boomers choosing to move back to the city if they've been living in the suburbs, it is still more of that niche. And like Rodney said, it's a growing population, so there may be more people to purchase homes in that area, but there's other trends that have to be considered as well. There's the, you know, the housing crisis trend and the, the net worth decline and how much can people afford. And, and for the most part, people are going to age where they are right today. And I'll, the, the last thing I'll say is that that's what makes it so important that we have a good range of options for people because people, once they end up in a place and they're settled in, in their midlife, they like to be there. And so my vision uh, for the country is that we provide enough options at a wide, wide range of price points that everyone can find what they need. Within their community within their community, absolutely. And, and keep in mind also that people's social networks and their support ne networks are established over, you know, decades. And you don't want to disrupt those networks, especially as people move into older age when they need to fall back on those networks. So it really is important to be thinking of how can we make the existing community work better so people can stay where they are. Not necessarily in their same homes, even though that's what people tell us they want to do, but at least close to those social networks and support networks that they've developed. So I think we're out of time. I know I'll be on uh, Twitter at Dr. Urban Policy for a while if folks want to send questions after uh, we're done here. But uh, I, I want to, for one, thank everyone that's come out today, and, and thanks, thanks again to the folks at APA Virginia and APA. Uh, and all the folks behind the series. Glad to be here today. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the great presentation, John and Rodney. And I want to thank everyone for attending today's webcast. 
I just want to go through a few reminders. First off, to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to planning.org slash CM, select today's date, September 28th, and then select today's webcast. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. Also, we are recording today's session, so you'll be able to find recording of this webcast along with a six-slide-per-page PDF at utahapa.org webcast archive and also on YouTube. This concludes today's session, and I want to thank everyone again for attending.